What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? What's stopping you? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. Those of you who have questions about the Catholic faith, maybe you don't have a, uh, a friend at work or uh, you know, a next door neighbor who is Catholic, and you just don't know who to ask, to get those questions answered? Well, you can certainly ask us. Here's our phone number, 1-800-585-9396, 1-800-585-9396. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for our response and then text us your first name and your brief question. Again, message and data rates may apply, for some folks anyway. The phone number, 1-800-585-9396. For those of you who are watching us on TV, you can send us your questions via email, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. Jeff Burson is our producer today. Matt Kubinski is on social media. No, actually, he's on the phones today. Jeff Burson is handling social media, so you can ask your questions via YouTube and Facebook. I'm Tom Price, along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Couldn't be better. How about you? You could not. It's impossible it for you impossible. to be better. It is impossible. It is impossible. It's a beautiful day. Wow. You know, I had a buddy in grad school. When you ever asked him how he was, his answer was always, I've been worse. Oh, gee. And I said, why do you do that? And he's like, well, first of all, if I tell you I'm absolutely top of the world, what if you're having a bad day? <laughs> you know, <laughs> not to change the subject here, but I am coming around to it. It's my wife's blood type is B positive. And I think that's, <laughs> why, I think <laughs> that's why she is always such a positive person. Oh, that's it's, great. It, it's in the blood. That's fantastic. Here's an, a question that we received uh, recently from Brenda watching us on Facebook. Brenda says, how does the church deal with those affected with mental health illnesses and what help is given to those who have that as their obstacle to return to the church? Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, the church takes a very sane and scientific view towards towards mental health, just the way it, the same way it does towards physical health. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I mean, this is something that can be treated with the tools of natural science and and uh, well, not with natural science, but with with science based, evidence based practices in sure. you know, medical care. Um, and so there's no objection to someone who's suffering from mental health uh, issues. Uh, either seeking therapeutic solutions or, or, or pharmacological solutions. I mean, all that's perfectly legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and if, in fact, the church has been in the mental health business longer than anybody. And you know, in the in the in the high Middle Ages, it became common practice for the church to exercise the power of forgiveness of sins in the context of private confession. Right. See, in antiquity, the sacrament of reconciliation or or penance was often a public affair, mm -hmm. right? But the monks, the monks in the deserts began the practice of, of the private confession of sins just as a, for purposes of spiritual direction, not necessarily to obtain forgiveness of sins through the sacrament. Oh, okay. right? Just like it's a good idea to talk about your issues with somebody, you know, sure. to get direction on your life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and which is kind of a sort of a sort of proto, you know, counseling therapy situation, if you think about it. And then the church in her wisdom sort of fused the sacrament of reconciliation to that practice of private confession and actually made it mandatory. So the, the appropriate way to receive the sacrament of penance now is in the context of the private auricular confession. That became the law of the church in 1215 in the Fourth Lateran Council. Okay. And as that, as that practice became more and more common throughout the Catholic world, Catholics began to sort of have to deal therapeutically with some of the neurotic conditions that would come up in the context of private confession. And so you, you begin to see the publication of confessional manuals. And, and one of the things the church discerned very quickly is that there's a big difference between, between actual moral guilt, mm -hmm. right, and, and, uh, and, a, and a kind of neurotic imbalance. And so it, te it taught pastors how to differentiate those things and then the way to treat the neurotic imbalances. Uh. Now, one of the, the tried-and-true methods of, say, cognitive behavioral therapy or techniques for treating mental disorders, especially neuroticism, is exposure therapy. So let's say you have a fear of elevators, you know, um, and, uh, uh, and so, you know, you, you, you can't get on an elevator without having a panic attack. Well, the, the therapist will tell you, well, you start by getting like three feet next to an elevator. 
and then you then you move it to two feet, then you mm. move it to one foot, then you stick your do- your foot in, then you ride up one floor, then you ride up two, you know, and then through exposure you gradually desensitize okay. yourself. Well, those same kinds of principles were taught to spiritual directors a- ages and ages and ages ago. Well, somebody, for instance, is has uh, suffers from scrupulosity, right? And they think that everything they do is wrong, all right? Well, the pastors would 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 tell them, all right, you're not allowed to confess that sin because it's not a sin, all right? Sure. And and you have to you have to habituate yourself to 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 acting in ways that are sane, all right? And the and the so the confessional actually is where this kind of therapeutic treatment of neuroticism was born in the Western tradition. And there's always been a you know close cooperation between the church and the health and well-being of the total person, physical, mental, spiritual. Okay, very good. Hope that's uh, helpful for you. Thank you so much for your email there. Here's one now from Terry in Shawnee, Kansas. Terry says, I am a revert to the Catholic Church for about 18 months now. I have a question about Peter being the rock. I have heard the argument the Protestants make about the Greek translation meaning a pebble and not a rock. What is the correct uh, answer and does this matter? Terry from Shawnee, Kansas. Um, yeah, that's, well, first of all, I appreciate the question. Mm-hmm. That's not true. I mean, the, the, the Greek text says, you know, you are Petros, which is just a masculine form of the word Petra, which means rock. Okay. okay. And and what Jesus literally says in, in the Greek New Testament is you are Petros, and on this Petra I will build my church. Okay. Um, and you can look at the the Syriac targums. That's the the Syriac is the language closest to Aramaic, mm-hmm. that, in which we actually have biblical texts from antiquity, and it's uh, it's kepha, which is the Greek word. I mean the Syriac word for rock, and it's your kepha, and on this kepha, I'm going to build my church. So it's pretty clear etymologically, yeah, from yeah. syntactically, that that rock is rock. Peter is Peter is rock. And in fact, good biblical scholars, even Protestant biblical scholars, even anti-Catholic biblical scholars, recognize that you can't get away from the syntax. Of the sentence, all right. There's a guy named D. A. Carson, who's very anti-Catholic theologically. All right? Okay, teaches at Trinity Divinity School, where I did my uh, master's degree mm-hmm. before I was Catholic, and uh, he wrote a little article on Saint Peter for a book called Great Leaders of the Christian Church, published by Moody Press, which is a really anti-Catholic publisher. Yes. Okay, yes. and and in that little article, and this is you know one of the most anti-Catholic but highly regarded evangelical biblical scholars, yeah. published in a deeply anti-Catholic press, he says, look, syntactically, Peter's a rock. I mean, you just can't get away from that, grammatically speaking. Now, does that mean you have to be Catholic? And then, of course, he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't want to swallow the whole potato. Right. Right. right? Okay. But at least as far as the grammar is concerned. I mean, it's not rocket science. Okay. You know. So the word pebble, who knows where that is? And, and it's from. just irrelevant. I mean, it's like, so, so, I mean, the, y- 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 so call it a pebble. I mean, if you want to, you're, you're the, the rocky thing, and on this rocky thing, I'm going to build my church. The issue, the issue is what is Christ saying about St. Peter and his right. role relative to the foundation of the church's unity? You, you could call it, you know, you're the, you're the brick. You're the, you're the cinder block, you know, you know, you're the cinder block. And on this cinder block, I'm going to build my church and I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Three distinct metaphors by which Jesus singles out Peter in that one passage of having a unique role in the foundation of the church. There we go. Terry, thank you so much for your question. We do appreciate that. When we come back from our quick break, we'll talk with Linda in Niagara Falls, also Jacob in Topeka, Kansas. And we've got a line open for you right now, 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. It's called a communion here on EWTN. Sharing the fullness of the Catholic faith. 1-800-585-9396. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 1-800-585-9396. We begin with Linda in Niagara Falls. Hopefully not in Niagara Falls, but, you know, the city of Niagara Falls. Live, uh, call, listening to us today on Amazon Echo. Linda, what's on your mind today? Hi, um, my friend's daughter is um got married outside of the catholic church she did all of her sacraments except confirmation class she's trying to um 
take her confirmation class and then trying to get her daughter baptized. But they're saying that she first has to have her marriage blessed before she can take the class. Okay. And so what's the question? And so does that sound right? Like she can't Absolutely. It sounds, it sounds okay. correct, yes. And I'll tell you why. So okay. if, if, you are, uh, if you are not a Christian person, if you're, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you're a nothing, you're a pagan, you're a Buddhist, you're a Hindu, all right, you can validly marry, all right, in a natural marriage. Like man and woman okay. come together to make a family, live together forever, that's a marriage, natural marriage. But it's not a sacrament. Uh, All right. If you are a baptized person and you marry another baptized person, well, you're both members of Christ by virtue of your baptism. So Jesus is intrinsically connected to that marriage in a way that he is not connected to two unbaptized people that are married. All Mm -hmm. right. And and when two Christian people marry, they have the promise of God's grace to accompany them, not only to raise children and build a family, but also to bring their spouse and their children to God, right? Marriage becomes a sacrament, a sign of the death of Christ for his body, which is the church. And, and husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and, and gave himself up for her so that he might bring her to God spotless and pure. So the meaning of Christian marriage encompasses everything good about natural marriage, but ratchets it up a bit, raises mm-hmm. it to the supernatural level, and now makes it about not just building a family in this world, but 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 translating that family to the kingdom of heaven and making it a sign of transcendence for the whole world. All right, so it becomes a, a supernatural event. All right, and it's a sacrament. Now, who has jurisdiction over the sacraments? Well, the church that Christ founded. Sure, the church has the right, the authority, and the duty to actually to manage the the distribution of the sacraments. All right, to make sure that they're done properly. Now, one of the things about marriage is marriage is a public act. Right, we we have we hold marriages publicly uh, because we want to signal to the world. You know, if I'm if I'm marrying a woman, hey, she's off limits now. Or if you're a woman marrying a man, hey, he's off limits now. Right. You know, and uh, and and the rest of the world has an obligation to treat that married couple in a in a different way now that they're publicly pledged to one another. Right, because marriage is not just a private action; it's a public action for the sake of the common good. All right. And, uh, and that's also true within the church, right? The church recognizes marriage as a state of life, a particular state of life, just like being a priest or religious is a state of life, all right? And it's, it's governed by certain laws and principles uh, that, uh, uh, that, 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 that form it and shape it in the direction that it ought to go, all right? So as a sacrament, just like the Eucharist or baptism or anything else, the church has a right to say how it's going to be celebrated, all right? Now, if you're a Catholic— you understand the jurisdiction of the church, the authority of the church to regulate the sacraments and to distribute them, all right? And, uh, and the church says, you know what, as a sacrament, it's right and just that this sacrament be performed in a church, in a Catholic church, witnessed by a Catholic priest or a mm-hmm. deacon, a minister of the church, all right, and uh, in a sacred space, and, and ideally also associated with the holy sacrifice of the Mass, all right? That's the way it ought to be done, to, to, to signal, to s- set this thing apart as something belonging to the church, and these people entering into it, into a state of life that's more than just a man and a woman building a family, but a man and a woman building a family as Christians in the church for the sake of the kingdom of God, accompanied by a promise of God's grace. Now, if you don't do it that way, all right, mm-hmm. if, you, if you don't follow the rules that the church lays out, then your marriage is not actually valid. It's not a valid marriage. If you're a Catholic person and you go, you know, you go get married uh, in front of a justice of the peace, you know, at the city park or something, right? It, you, you ought to be uh, seeking to achieve a sacramental marriage. Right. And you're treating it as just as like, this is no different from the marriage of two Buddhists or two atheists. Well, mm-hmm. it is different. It's fundamentally different, all right? And church says your refusal to follow the law of the church actually means that you're not validly married. You got to do it the way the church says, okay? Now, if, what happens when two people live together, you know, with full conjugal union and they're not married? What do we call that state of life? Fornication, right? That's what we call it. All right. So you got to get that straight. All right. And just like any two people, if they're up to something they ought not to be up to, all right. Well, if you come to the church and you say, I'm going to be reconciled to the church, like, great, fantastic. Love to have you. Let's straighten out this thing that you're doing that you ought not to be doing. All right. Now, fortunately, in this kind of situation, it's very easy to do. It's not hard at all. All right. Provided that neither of them is married to anybody else, right? That this is not like a second or third marriage and there's another spouse still living someplace. 
uh, and they and they can validly lawfully marry, all they got to do is show up at the parish one afternoon and basically say their vows in front of a Catholic priest. Boom, you're good to go. Okay, very good. Linda, thank you so much for your call. That opens up a line for you now, 1-800-585-9396. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 1-800-585-9396. This is called a communion here on EWTN. Jacob is listening in Topeka on the EWTN app. Fantastic. Jacob, what's on your mind today? Hi, guys. Uh, I called in yesterday at the end of the show. I wanted to call back and get some more some more good stuff in with you guys. Sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. So my question is, um, is there a need for sanctification in the penal substitution uh, justification by faith alone perspective? Okay, thanks. I appreciate the question. So you're asking me now, not, not about the Catholic perspective, but the Protestant point of view. If you are a Protestant, what is your motive for seeking sanctification? Is that the question? Yes, because okay. I don't see I don't see any need to be sanctified from that perspective. Sure, sure, sure. Well, there there are a couple of different answers to that question that a Protestant would give. Now, first of all, before I since this is a Catholic show, yes. before I give the Protestant point of view, let me explain to you for a Catholic what is the motive to seek sanctification, to seek holiness. All right, the motive is that the the mode of our union with God is charity. Right? right, And the more charity you have, the more you are united to God, the deeper your relationship with God. Just mm-hmm. like the mode of my union to my wife is charity. The end is family, bearing, bearing children together. But the, 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 the form of that union is love. All right, The more love I have, the more love she has for me, the deeper our union. That's the motive for a Catholic to sing sanctification. Mm-hmm. The mode of our union with God is charity. Charity is the essence of sanctity. All right, and the gift of grace by the Holy Spirit is that we can conform our lives to Christ, who is the model of charity, and grow in deeper and deeper communion with God. Okay, now, that's the real motive. That's the good motive. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus says, for they will see God. Now, Protestants do not believe that the mode of our union with God is charity. In fact, they explicitly deny that. The mode of our union with God, according to Protestants, is through faith by way of a legal transaction where God imputes the righteousness of Christ to a believer and imputes the sins of the believer to Christ. So it's a legal transaction, not a moral union, hmm. all right, um, and, uh, in which you are counted as righteous even though you remain objectively wicked. That's the standard Protestant position. That's why it's salvation by faith alone okay. and not by the transformation of the okay. moral life. So our, our friend Jacob wants to know, if you're a Protestant and you hold that, what would your motive be for sanctification? That is a very controverted question in the history of the Protestant tradition. And uh, not surprisingly, Protestants give very, very different answers to that question. All right, so Martin Luther, for instance, would argue that what he would call legal righteousness, you know, the outward conformity to the rule of law, is necessary not for salvation, not to be united to God, Mm -hmm. but to live effectively in civil society, which stands to reason. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that would be one motive, but it wouldn't. It would be. It would not be intrinsically connected to the next life. Okay. Okay. Um, there were there were Puritan theologians who took the line that if that that along with the gift of justification and regeneration, also comes the gift of sanctification. All right, and that one can in fact grow in a deeper moral union with God, as Catholics would admit. All right even though that's not the ground of your salvation. That's not the reason for your salvation. And they also would argue that that moral transformation in a person's life would be evidence that they actually were called and elected and saved. All right, see, there's a a dogma within Protestantism, at least the Reformed tradition, Mm -hmm. that a man can know with certainty that he's saved. the, The Westminster Confession says you can know infallibly that you're elect, that you're saved, that you're regenerated. And so that, that prompts a huge debate in, in the Reformed tradition. Well, how do I know if I'm one of the elect? Yeah. All right, and there were basically two schools of thought. All right? One school of thought said, well, works don't save you, but they're evidence of salvation. Mm-hmm. And so you need to have them. It basically is a basis of assurance. It was called the practical syllogism or the syllogismus practicus. All right? And it's at, at certain extremes, particularly in the New England strain, they—, they it was it was almost it was almost worse than the worst caricature of Catholic 
so-called works righteousness. I mean, you had guys like Thomas Hooker in New England arguing that you, that you had to purify your heart before you could even receive grace. I mean, it was, it was so moralistic that, like, you had no assurance of salvation unless you lived a morally pure life, i.e. Puritanism. All right. Mm. But then there were other Puritans that took the, a radically different point of view and said, no, 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 you're, you're falling back into that Catholicism that we wanted to run away from. All right. And it's all by grace alone and works are completely unnecessary. And it's just by the immediate testimony of the Holy Spirit in your heart without any regard for your moral life that you know you're saved. And those are the so-called antinomians. And if you if you've read about the controversies in New England, in the in the you know early decades of the Puritan colonies, Anne Hutchinson was associated with the so-called antinomian movement, and that that thing just broke down into into incoherence very very fast. And Puritanism split over that question about do you need works to be evidence of your salvation, or do you or do you not need them at all? Okay, and uh, and you'll so you'll find these shades of meaning with different nuances. May, maybe there's some kind of union that I can achieve with God that will bring me happiness. But it's not a but I'll, but but it's not necessary to get to heaven. I mean, yeah. You know, yeah. maybe I need it as evidence of my regeneration. Maybe that's the basis of my assurance, or maybe I don't need them at all. All right, and there remains with to this to this day within Protestantism a range of opinions and disagreement about the the reasons and the need for sanctification within the Christian life. It's much simpler in the Catholic tradition. <laughs> the mode of our union with God is charity. It's much easier. And and when it comes to questions of assurance. We have the only assurance that we need, which is where is grace found and where is Jesus? In the sacraments of the church. Remain united to Christ in the sacrament. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood you know, abides in me and I in him, you'll have life. If we remain in Christ and his words remain in us, we abide in him, we eat his flesh and drink his blood, participate in the sacramental mystery of the church, we have assurances that Christ is present in those sacramental mysteries. Jesus says, whoever perseveres to the end will be saved. Let's stay there. Let's persevere to the end. We have assurance of salvation in that sense. We don't have to worry about all these 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 uh, introspective questions yeah. of religious yeah. experience that fractured the early Puritan movement. Jacob, thank you so much for your call. This is called to Communion here on EWTN. 1-800-585-9396 is our number. Uh, Maria is watching us right now on Facebook. She says, I have attended funerals and weddings that are Christian but not Catholic. And they always end with the pastor asking for all that want to be saved, please join in in saying the salvation prayer. So as a Catholic, what am I to do? Okay, thanks. I appreciate it. So, you know, we were just talking about the mode of salvation in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Okay, that's not the only thing he says about it, but he tells us to start there. St. Paul says that we die with Christ in baptism mm -hmm. and are raised again with him to new life. So you entered into the state of life through your baptism and the profession of faith that your godparents made on your behalf, or if you were an adult convert, when you yourself made that profession of faith, that entered you into the way of salvation. But Jesus also says, he who perseveres to the end will be saved. So you have to, you have to continue in that state, remain in fellowship with Christ for your whole life, all right? Cultivate that relationship of love and charity with him and with your neighbor, relying on the grace of the Holy Spirit, seeking Christ in the sacraments. And if you do that, Jesus says, you'll be saved, all right? Salvation is not something that can be guaranteed by reciting a mantra, you know, I'm going to recite a formula, yeah. and somehow I'm magically guaranteed uh, eternal life. Now, many times those sinners' prayer, those sinners' prayers that Protestant pastors urge people to pray, they're they're not sufficient to get you to heaven, but they're not bad in content. If, there, if the form of it's something like, "Dear Jesus, forgive me for my sins and come into my life." I mean, you can say that all day long, sure. but saying it once isn't going to get you to heaven. Very good. Maria, thank you for checking us out on Facebook today. When we return, it'll be Jesus in Houston, Val in Columbus, Ohio, here on Call to Communion. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. Hey, back to the phones now at 1-800-585-9396. We continue with Jesus listening in Houston uh, via Guadalupe Radio, AM 1430. Jesus, what's on your mind today? Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for your service to the church. You guys are amazing, and uh, you guys play, played a great role in my conversion story. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have a question. There is a very popular Hispanic pastor here in Houston who has a radio program. So I called and asked him if, on the air about First Timothy 3.15. I asked if, if there are more than 50,000 plus denominations in the U.S. alone, 
how do you know you're teaching the truth about the Christian doctrine? He said, it doesn't matter how many denominations there are or which denomination you belong to, as long as you, uh, as long as they teach you the 16 necessary uh, doctrines for Christian salvation. Are you familiar with this uh, claim? Oh, sure. Very familiar with it. 16. Is, is well, that what you said, Jesus? Yes, yes. Oh, I don't, I, okay. I don't, I, I, don't know, I don't know about his 16, <laughs> but, but I, I understand very well the position of many Protestant pastors that, that, that uh, the denominational structure or ecclesiology is unimportant, un- insignificant in our spiritual life, and that what matters is that you, you affirm a, a, a small subset of doctrinal propositions or have a certain set of religious experiences. That, that, I'm very common with that. Okay. I'm very familiar with that idea. Right. Let me ask you a question. Does Jesus ever say that? Does no, Jesus never. Does Jesus teach that there's, a, that there's a core set of doctrines that you have to affirm, and and if you as long as you affirm those sixteen, then you're good to go. I don't think right. so. No, actually, this says no. nothing of the sort. So I mean, you, Jesus, the beginning of Jesus's ministry is the annunciation, the the announcement that the kingdom of God is present in Him. All right, the kingdom of God, the promised kingdom of God, the messianic kingdom the Jews were anticipating, has has emerged in His visible ministry. All right. And it marked an end of an era, all right, that the old law was done away with, and and the barrier between Jew and Gentile was now eliminated, and all people were called to reconciliation in the church which Christ founded, characterized by a new way of life, the writing of the law on our minds and placing it on our hearts, exemplified in the ethics of the Sermon on the Mount, those who are pure in heart and hunger and thirst for righteousness and the poor in spirit and so forth, Mm -hmm. all right? This is the mode of life of the disciples of Christ in the kingdom of God, empowered by the gift of the Holy Spirit. But in that visible society that Christ established, of course, he said to St. Peter, you're Peter on this rock, I'll build my church. Church means those that are called out, okay, ecclesia, give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He also established, say, for example, a mode of formal worship. He said, do this in memory of me, and he delivered to us the elements of the sacred liturgy. He commanded that the disciples baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He also gave them the power to forgive sins. Whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. He gave them the power to exercise demons, to heal the sick, and the command to teach everything that he had commanded them. Did he say, teach 16 doctrinal truths that this guy on the radio says? No, he said, teach everything I have commanded you, none of which he wrote down. All of it was oral tradition. Some of that oral tradition is conveyed in the writing of the Gospels, but not all of it. Some of it was conveyed to the church uh, by way of the sacramental mystery, by way of the liturgy. St. Paul speaks about that specifically in 1 Corinthians. He says, the tradition I receive from the Lord I hand on to you. And then he describes the elements of the liturgy. And he says, if anyone wants to be contentious or has another practice, know that we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Mm. All right, he said in 1 Corinthians uh, 1, verse 10, he says, I insist that you agree on 16 things. No, 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 no. <laughs> he says, I insist that you insist that you agree on everything. Right. That you agree on everything. All right. And so the, the if you really want to get down to what is the essential truth taught by Christ, is that the whole body of Christian truth, including its formal worship, is to be conveyed to the world in perpetuity by the church that he founded, guaranteed by his divine authority. That, that's what you have to believe. Yeah, exactly. Not this guy's little list of 16 things. Uh, no. Jesus, thank you so much for your call. This is called to Communion here on EWTN. 1-800-585-9396 is our number. 1-800-585-9396. Val is listening in Columbus right now on the blowtorch there, AM 820, St. Gabriel Radio. Hey, Val, what's on your mind today? Hi. Thanks, guys, for taking my call. Sure. Um, my question is um, in regards to um, so salvation, and uh, I'm a recent convert. In 2017, I entered the church, um, was raised as a Protestant, and I have um, some close family members that we've had a lot of conversations about, mm-hmm. um, a close family member who believes uh, what he calls uh, the Reformed election theology is correct. Yep. Um, but— he said that, um, well, my understanding of Catholic doctrine is that we are saved by grace through faith, which compels us to work. And, um, but 
two days ago, you had taken a call um, where you were talking about perseverance, that it comes, um, I know faith is a gift from God, but that perseverance is a gift from God. And so when we're baptized, uh, the Catholic doctrine is that we are actually regenerated. Um, But your answer led me to believe that God chooses some people to give perseverance to and some not to. And is that because he knows that they weren't going to persevere anyway? It, that started to sound a little bit like predestination to me, and it's the first time that something Catholic doctrine was a little bit off to me. Could you clarify yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. Please? Sure thing. Sure thing. I appreciate it. So the doctrine of perseverance is is not one that uh, is often preached in the pulpit of Catholic churches, in the ambo of Catholic churches, but it is a dogma of the Catholic Church, is affirmed by the Council of Trent, and is explicated most amply in the writings of St. Augustine of Hippo, okay? And, and the Church does teach the doctrine of predestination, but not as the Calvinists teach it, okay? So the Church does believe, because predestination is a biblical word, it is a biblical concept. We find the notion of predestination election all through the Old and New Testaments, so the Church teaches it. And what the Church says about, pre- what, first let me tell you what Calvinists say and why they're wrong. The Calvinist says that before anybody did anything good or bad, before the foundation of the world, that God planned, specifically decreed, that the that the majority of the human race would be destined for damnation. So it's a positive decree of damnation, and that a minority would be predestined to salvation without any regard to anything they've done, good or bad, before the foundation of the world, just to display the differentiation between elect and reprobate, righteous and wicked, God determines to send the vast majority of the human race to hell. Right? That's the that's the Calvinist position. Right? It's not exactly the good news. It's yeah, more like the bad news. Yeah. Okay. Now, and the Catholic Church, and there's there, there's several other entailments of the of the of the Calvinist point of view, like for instance, the belief that Christ did not die for everyone, but he only died for the elect. Other things like that that mm-hmm. the Catholic Church rejects. Okay. okay. Catholic Church says oh, that's ridiculous. God does not God does not predetermine without regard to foreseen demerits does not predetermine to send the vast majority of the human race to hell without any regard for whether they're good or bad. I mean, that's just ridiculous, okay? However, the Church does teach that we cannot, we cannot get to heaven without God's grace, and you cannot earn God's grace by definition. I mean, if you could earn it, it wouldn't be grace. It'd be, it would just be something that I deserved, right? And, and, uh, uh, and, and, you, and, 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 and just because you have grace— it's not like God gives you grace and leaves you up to your own devices to see how far you can get with it, okay? Um, you also need God's grace to remain in God's grace. Okay. You need God's grace to remain in God's grace, right? That's how much we have to rely on grace. Hmm. And to remain in God's grace until the very end, what does require our free cooperation, and yet it's still a gift of God, and that's the gift of perseverance. And what you said is exactly correct, that God does not grant the gift of perseverance to everyone, because that's manifest. Not everybody is saved. Not everybody makes it to the end. There are people who leave the faith, who die in mortal sin and go to hell, okay? Now, uh, here's the question the Church does not answer, all right? Why does God give efficacious grace, grace that brings you all the way to the finish line? Why does He give that grace to some and to, not to others? All right, what, what's the basis of His determination? Now, uh, the Calvinists just say, well, He's just decided to send you, you to hell before you do anything good or bad, and there's nothing you can do about it. Church says no, that's not correct. Why does he do it? Why why doesn't why isn't everyone saved? Right? It can't simply be. You can't throw the whole explanation back on human free cooperation or human free will, because then the reason for our salvation lies in us. Mm-hmm. You say that's the motive of Catholic theologians. No, there, there there has to be God's initiative must be taken into consideration. It's the determining factor. All right, it's grace. All right. So why does God do it? Why does he give grace to one to persevere to the end and not to another, if it's not from a positive degree of damnation, as the Calvinists teach? Now, there are two opinions in the Catholic tradition on that question, and both of them are allowable. Why? Right? Both of them are allowable opinions. The, the, the Jesuit school of theology, associated with a guy named Molina, says that God foresees—this is an opinion, this is not a dogma, okay? okay? The Jesuits, the Molinists say— God foresees the use, the, that, the, the free use 
that humans will make of grace and then determines to give persevering grace or not based on his knowledge of what would have happened or what will happen. So his knowledge of future mm. uh, counterfactuals. Okay. Right. So there's a, there's, there's, it's, that's an attempt to explain the mystery with reference to something that's interior to us. It's still God's decision to give grace, but he does so based on his knowledge of future uh, free human action. That's the Jesuit point of view. The Dominicans say, mm, nope, you're granting too much to the human side of things. We need, to, we need to grant more to the divine side of things. We don't know. We don't know. All okay. right. So one of them stresses sort of divine providence more. One mm-hmm. of them stresses human freedom more. And, and the truth is someplace in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. You know? And the church has, has never dogmatically taught that one or the other of those theories is correct. Now, let's, to, 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 to guard against misunderstanding, let mm-hmm. me teach a few, say a few other things the Catholic Church teaches about grace. Calvinists believe that grace cannot be resisted. Catholic Church says grace can be resisted. You can resist grace. God can offer you grace. You can resist it. Yeah. So don't. Don't, don't do resist that. grace. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, the Calvinists teach that God does not want everybody to be saved. The Catholic Church says God does want everybody to be saved. All right. The Calvinists teach that we cannot cooperate with God's grace, that everything that happens in us of a supernatural nature is 100% God's initiative. Motorism is what that's called. Okay. Um, uh, the Catholic Church says no. God's initiative is primary, but our free cooperation is also necessary and instrumental. I mean, it's a it's a real contributor. It's a real instrumental cause of our salvation. Our free cooperation is meaningful. This can be seen most beautifully in the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You can't get any more predestined than the Blessed Virgin Mary. <laughs> I mean, she was predestined from the foundation of the world to be the mother of God. Right. It's part of God's design from the get-go. And yet, it's not like God just came and the Holy Spirit impregnated her without asking. That's true. The, 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 at the Annunciation, Angel Gabriel says, this is God's plan for you. Now, she was destined to say yes, but her yes was still meaningful. It wasn't meaningless. It wasn't devoid of meaning. She right. said, be it done to me according to thy word. Yeah. And God chose to use her free cooperation as the means to bring about his plan. Okay. There you go. Hey, uh, Val, thank you so much for if, your call. If, if you want a really good detailed analysis of the Catholic doctrine of predestination mm-hmm. and how it differs from the Calvinist view, um, look at Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, Garrigou Lagrange, and his book is simply called Predestination. And you can find it, probably find it online, like in public domain, but it's also published by TAN. Okay. Val, thanks again for your call. And I think EW10 catalog probably has it. It's possible. Yeah. We can look into that. Hey, uh, speaking of uh, catalog and things like that, I want to tell you about a brand new book now available from EWTN Publishing and is called Mother Angelica on God, His Home, and His Angels. Now, this great book contains five mini books authored by our dear Mother Angelica, written while in adoration of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And the five mini books are The Father's Splendor, Excellent, Healing Your Faith versus Faith Healing, Sons of Light, Before Time Began, and Inside the Kingdom. Mother talks about things like, what are the angels really like? And uh, what will we feel and sense in heaven? And also, what would it be like to experience the void before creation? This is deep stuff, and it was these were all written by Mother back in the day. And if you remember those little mini books, they are gems. Uh, EWTN Publishing has chosen five excellent books, bound them. It's a great thing to have in your own library. Mother Angelica on God, His Home, and His Angels. It's available right now at EWTNRC.com. EWTNRC.com. Back to the phones now. Let's talk with Mandy in Erie, Pennsylvania, listening on the EWTN app. Hey, Mandy, what's on your mind today? Hello, thank you for taking my call. I love the show. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Um, My question is, I have a friend who um, has kind of bounced uh, out of and back into attempted and then out of again the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And um, currently she is in limbo seeking what church she's going, what ecclesial community she's going to join. And I kind of asked her... um, you know, we've talked about um, 
St. Peter and the Papacy. We've talked about the Eucharist. Um, we've addressed all that. And I, I kind of asked her what, um, what she was looking for. And her answer was, well, it depends on what I, if I get, what I get out of the sermon. So how can I um, explain to her um, church history, scripture, et cetera, why the Mass is what we're supposed to do, why the Mass is what Jesus wants for us? Okay, Great question. thanks. It is a wonderful question. So w- one way is to, is to let's talk about the teaching of Jesus. Uh, where in the Gospels does Jesus ever tell us to listen to sermons? or to preach sermons, yeah. or to construct Christian worship around the communication of catechetical information. Nowhere. Nowhere. Jesus never says that. This, uh, this mode of worship is not mentioned by Christ in the Gospels. The, the vast majority of Jesus' t- teaching is about moral catechesis. It's about the quality of our interior life, our disposition, and our, and our actions towards our neighbor and towards God. Okay. And when he takes up the question of formal Christian worship, what does Jesus actually tell us? What, is, what, what does he deliver to us? Well, he gives us liturgical prayer. When you pray, pray like this, yeah. our Father who art in heaven, etc. All right. And r- liturgical ritual, do this in, in memory of me. Mm-hmm. All right. He, gives, he, he commands the, the, the celebration of the Mass in perpetuity. Also baptism, of course, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the sacrament of reconciliation, whoever sins you forgive, I forgive. Whoever sins you retain, I retain. Okay, this is all in, in the other sacraments as well, but those are the most manifest in the Gospels as they pertain to the public worship of the Church. And uh, the same thing when you read 1 Corinthians, which is the most liturgically oriented text of the New Testament. Um, there's extensive discussion of, of Holy Communion, the, the sacrifice of the Mass, the conditions for our proper reception, uh, the, the 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 formal unity of the Catholic Church expressed in that liturgical action. I mean, that's that's all explicit in the writing of the apostles and of Christ. Um, and uh, and and look, we you know the Catholic Church invented sermons. I mean, we like sermons. We got nothing against sermons. All right, uh, but the idea that that is the sort of the essence of Christian worship is there's there's no biblical basis for that. If you look at the Old Testament tradition, what was worship in the Old Testament tradition? It was the offering of sacrifice. Right. The offering of sacrifice. Mm-hmm. You, you, don't, you don't find discussion of, of sermonizing by Levitical priests in the temple. No, they, they did actually teach, all right? But, but, but all of the instructions about the formal worship of the people of God was the offering of sacrifice. St. Paul, uh, New Testament, does not do away with the reality of sacrifice as formal worship, but transforms it. So St. Paul says, for instance, in Romans chapter 13, he says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your spiritual act of worship. Right, and it's by conforming ourselves to the sufferings of Christ. He says, as the sufferings of Christ flow into our lives, so also His comfort overflows. And I make up in my own flesh what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of His body, the Church. Mm-hmm. This is my priestly ministry. He says in Romans 15 that I configure those Gentiles as a pure offering to God. Okay, that we offer our own lives in sacrifice is the principal act of Christian worship, conjoined to the sacrifice of the Mass. Do this in memory of me. All right. That's what Christian worship looks like now. Um, and it's, it's perfectly possible to, to listen to a sermon and, and not worship God, to not be inwardly transformed, and not to make a gift of myself in charity. It's perfectly possible, all right? Um, it's also possible to sit in the ceremony of a Mass and not intentionally associate myself with the sacrifice. But to properly worship God means that I am, like St. Paul says, I am submitting my own life, my joys, my sufferings, my sorrows, my family, my work, my hopes, my aspirations, joining them to the sacrifice of Jesus to offer them in praise and thanksgiving to Almighty God. St. Paul says, render to every man or to everyone what is his due, mm-hmm. honor to whom honor. All right, that's the principal act of worship, to render honor to God, above all, the honor of sacrifice, sacrificial worship, the offer of the body, blood, soul, and divinity of his son, Jesus. Mandy, thank you so much for your call. This is called to Communion here on EWTN. We go to Michael now in St. Louis listening to us on Covenant Network. Hey there, Michael. What's on your mind today? Michael. Hey, Michael. <laughs> Tom, Tom, thank you for thank you for taking my call. I appreciate it very much. Sure. My question is very yeah, simple. Uh, please, please turn your radio down, okay? Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Okay. So um, my question is just about dogmas. And so we as Catholics believe that certain dogmas are, need to be 
certainly held in faith by us, and they are necessary for our salvation. And so my question is, when we believe that our Protestant brothers and sisters can be saved with people who have faith in Jesus Christ, but, for example, deny the Marian dogmas, how do we, how do we hold that from a different point of view? How do we say that uh, a Protestant could be saved, especially one who, who rejects those dogmas in the Marian tradition? Okay, thanks, Michael. I appreciate it. Let me give you an analogy. So let's say you had a blood condition, and you went to a hematologist, and the hematologist said to you, well, I can save you, but to be saved, you're going to need to quit drinking, you're going to have to start exercising, uh, and you're going to have to take this medication every day. All right? Now, is it necessary to believe the doctor to be healed? In a way, yes, and in a way, no. Mm. I mean, if you go to the doctor and he says, this is the, this is the regimen that will bring you to health, uh-huh. and you go, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to go smoke cigars. <laughs> you're going to die. Yeah. You're not going to get well, okay? Um, but what if you, if you happen accidentally onto, you know, the abstinence, the exercise, and, uh, and you know, improbable, but the medication, yeah. all right? Your lack of explicit faith in the doctor's advice is not going to damn you because you're essentially taking the medicine anyway. All right, so the, the, the faith in the doctor's advice is a sort of instrumental cause mm-hmm. that's necessary to, to, to begin to imbibe the remedy. Okay. Okay, well, what if you get the, you quit drinking and you quit smoking, you start exercising, but you don't take the medication? Are your, are your odds of getting better, better than they would be if you kept up with the drinking and the smoking? Yeah, you're, you're, you're moving in the right direction, but you still ought to take the medication. Okay. Sure. This this is an analogy, I think, to the the catechism says that dogmas are lights, like they shape and form our life and give it direction. All right. But we're not saved in virtue of affirming a doctrinal statement. The dogmas are truths about God and the moral life, but it's not it's not my intellectual knowledge of them that saves them. It's my ability to implement what they say to me about the interior life. Okay. Okay. So you know the dogmas teach me to seek God's grace in the sacraments. Mm-hmm. together with the saints, all right? And, and the Catholic Church has the whole package. It's got the truth, it's got the, it's got the sacraments, it's got the saints, it's got all that I need, all right? But if a Protestant comes along and, you know, they say they've got two-thirds of the package, all right, but they're really intentional about it, you know, they might be able to squeeze a lot of good out of that two-thirds. You know what I mean? There, there are Catholics who have the whole package that don't live the faith. There are Protestants who, you know, have a... Have a uh, a, a weakened, you know, attenuated form of, of the Christian faith. I knew this pastor one time. The only sermon he ever preached was John 3.16. But, man, he got a lot of mileage out of John 3.16, <laughs> you know. And, and I've met Protestants who came to personal holiness through one verse of the Bible. You see what I'm saying? Sure. Right. sure. You're better off if you got the whole Bible, yes. all the sacraments, the whole truth, all the means of grace. All right. But is it is it impossible to be saved if you don't, consciously, explicitly affirm every single enumerated Catholic truth. No, that's not true, because it's not. The point of the truths is to guide and direct us in our activity, because it's it's the union of the heart in charity with God that saves, and our doctrine teaches this, and our sacraments empower it, all right? But the doctrines themselves aren't what save. Okay. Does that make sense? Thank you so much, yes. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. We've got Appreciate time for one more it. here, uh, a real quick one from Mark in Lewiston, Idaho. Mark, what's your question today? Mark in Lewiston, Idaho, are you there? I am. Go right ahead. You're on. Hey, thanks a lot for your guys' ministry. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to kind of turn the question around a little bit, just because I have a family member who's trying to leave the Catholic we we'll get about 30 seconds. Sure. What's stopping you from reverting to Protestantism? Oh, the Catholic faith is true, and Protestantism cannot. It is a logical impossibility that Protestantism be true because it is founded in incoherent doctrinal affirmations. All right? It, it cannot be true for one, no other reason. All right, well, lots of reasons, but the primary one is it, it postulates something incoherent about the nature of revelation. All right? Uh, the doctrine of sola scriptura that Protestants teach says that there, no article of faith can be held unless it's taught by sacred scripture. Yet sacred scripture doesn't teach that as an article of faith. Mm. And yet they profess it as an article of faith. It's incoherent. It is. I, ca- I can't believe in square circles. 
Okay. There it is. That's where we have to leave it, unfortunately. Mark, thank you so much for your call. Dr. David Anders, thank you, my friend. Thank you, Tom. Thanks also to uh, Jeff Burson and Matt Kabinski, everybody working behind the scenes. This is Tom Price, and we'll see you next time right here on EWTN's Call to Communion. God bless.